Ever wonder what the very first predator on Earth was? Well, in this video, that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about. What the first predator was, when it lived, how it affected other life when it was living, and when and why exactly it went extinct. Just to set the scene of when this was all going on, in the Ediacaran period of Earth's history, around 635 to 540 million years ago, the very first animals on Earth were evolving. Then in the Cambrian period, just after the Ediacaran, from 540 to around 485 million years ago, there was a major diversification and increase in complexity and skeletonization of these early animals. Skeletonization just referring to the animals producing more hard parts, skeletons, shells, etc., rather than just being soft-bodied, jelly-like organisms. This skeleton or hard part increase greatly improved the preservation of such organisms and thus the fossil record, which is why the Cambrian period seems like somewhat of an explosion of life because the organisms just got preserved a lot more easily. But there was also increases in abundance and diversification as well. The major reason though for the skeletonization part was likely evolutionary pressure. In other words, predation. So what was doing the predation at the time? What was the very first predator that caused these very first defense type mechanisms to evolve in early life? Earth's very first predators, or at least kind of big, scary apex predators in ecosystems, evolved around 515 million years ago within the time of the Cambrian explosion. And these were carnivorous invertebrates called anomalocarids. There were also other arthropod predators at the time, but anomalocarids were the apex predators in Cambrian ecosystems. They were segmented predatory arthropods, and early species of anomalocarids got up to 60 centimeters or 2 feet in length, which was much larger than most other organisms at the time, which made them pretty easily become apex predators. So what did they hunt and eat prey with? Well, they had a pair of appendages near their mouths that they used to capture and eat prey. And these appendages had 14 segments and each were lined with spikes. It's important to note though that among anomalocarids in general, there was a lot of morphological or shape diversity. And so many of the body forms may have had just one or one branching type of appendage. Um, most of the depictions of anomalocarids is one genus of anomalocarids, which is called anomalocaris. Uh, so if you see the term anomalocaris, uh, it's probably referring to this typical depiction of anomalocarids, but there was a lot of morphological diversity as well. They typically had 11 lateral swimming flaps with a distinctive head and large eyes on stalks. These large eyes on stalks really helped them to hunt prey. It's thought that they stalked their prey with their large compound eyes, and they were able to swim quickly to catch up with it and grab it with their spiky appendages. Later in the Cambrian, anomalocarid species got up to two meters instead of two feet, like we talked about earlier. And this is around 6.6 .6 feet. So they got pretty big. And again, organisms at the time were very primitive and not that big yet. So this just made them more and more successful. Other arthropods, for example, like trilobites, were also successful and acted not only as their prey, but also predators, but they were much smaller than anomalocarids and therefore preyed on much smaller organisms. But I should clarify that this much smaller didn't last very long. Trilobites got way bigger throughout the Paleozoic. Well, bigger and smaller. They just completely diversified into all these crazy different types of forms. And some trilobites got up to, I think it's like 70 centimeters. I have a trilobite video if you want to check it out, but they got really big. But in the Cambrian, they were still relatively small, especially compared to the up to two meters of anomaly carrots out there. And these first predators didn't just live in one type of environment, they actually occupied a diverse range of ecological niches in the Cambrian oceans, and they likely fed on organisms like other arthropods, like trilobites, for example, worms and other annelids, and mollusks at the time. They remained the apex predators throughout their entire time range. But this time range was not that long. They were only around until the end of the Cambrian, so around 488 to 485-ish million years ago is when they disappeared, and given that they evolved around 515 million years ago, 
this didn't give them much time compared to other organisms like trilobites that lived for 300 million years <laughs> to, uh, you know, rule the seas. But even with this relatively short time range, they played a crucial role in shaping the earliest and the later, the future ecosystems, even after they were gone. As the first predators, they drove critical evolutionary adaptations and diversification through causing pressure on other organisms, prey organisms, to evolve things like defense mechanisms, spines, hard parts, skeletons, shells, armor, burrowing abilities, swimming faster. All of these adaptations were mainly, or in large part at least, due to the pressure that these first predators put on them. With time, they also drove increased diversity and complexity in predators themselves because they provided that competition for that space. And this led to more advanced hunting strategies and larger predators with time, like nautiloids, ammonoids, bigger and faster trilobites, uh, eurypterids, which came directly after anomalocarids that evolved in the Ordovician and became these huge sea scorpion type things that were then the major predators after anomalocarids. So what exactly were the key developments that anomalocarids likely played a huge role in causing? Well, one, their evolution and the time in which they were preying on other organisms coincided with the sharp increase in skeletonized organisms like trilobites and brachiopods, like we talked about earlier. And it's been suggested that a change in ocean chemistry in which calcium carbonate became a lot more thermodynamically favorable to secrete. In other words, the ocean chemistry became easier to make skeletons out of. That has been suggested to have potentially allowed this skeleton increase, but something had to actually drive it, trigger it, or force it really to happen. And this driver was likely anomalocarids with their selective pressure to make prey organisms basically evolve defense mechanisms like having skeletons. So this likely played a huge role in this evolutionary adaptation. In other words, causing almost the complete, you know, idea that we have of the Cambrian explosion, this, this fossil record that just explodes with hard parts secreting life right during this, you know, period. But it's not just skeletons that organisms had to evolve. Just like we showed earlier, other defense mechanisms like spines, armor, enhanced mobility, faster and more advanced burrowing abilities, ability to secrete toxins, all of these things evolved around this time and greatly increased in abundance and diversity at this time across multiple lineages because, or not fully, but in part, in large part, because of the anomalocarids pressure. The biggest effect, though, that the anomalocarids had on not only the ecosystems at the time they lived, but on all ecosystems after they lived was the initiation of this predator-prey arms race that basically has continued until today, driving evolution and diversification of both predators and prey organisms ever since, really. But despite their huge role in early ecosystems and their incredible impact on ecosystems after, they did only have a short time range, like we talked about earlier, around 15 million years, which compared to the 300 million years that trilobites lived seems like really tiny. But it's not like anomalocarids weren't successful. So what exactly caused them to go extinct while other arthropods like trilobites just kept diversifying? Well, one potential cause is shifts in environmental conditions like changes in sea levels, ocean chemistry, nutrient availability, etc. They might not have dealt with such changes as well as things like trilobites that might have been more diverse by then and therefore more change resistant. Uh, the more diverse a group of organisms is, the more likely it is that one of their groups or one or more of their groups is to survive such changes because maybe they've adapted something that can survive these things or maybe they're just more versatile in terms of the environmental conditions they can handle. Anomalocarids, you know, they did occupy diverse ecological niches, but they were very specialized in what they did, how they hunted, how they lived, and what role they played in those niches. And this specialization to one thing, one type of living behavior, might have contributed to their susceptibility to changes like this. Whereas trilobites, 
had many different behaviors. There were burrowing trilobites that didn't even have eyes. There were trilobites with really advanced, complex eyes that hunted and preyed on other organisms. There were trilobites that swam in the open ocean. There were trilobites that scurried along the bottom of the sea floor. So they had many different living behaviors and therefore some sort of group of trilobite always survived these many extinction events that they went through. <laughs> Competition was another likely contributing factor to causing the extinction of anomalocarids because newly evolved predatory groups were coming onto the scene, like other arthropods and early fish, and like eurypterids, the big sea scorpions we saw earlier. There also may have been extinctions of certain prey organisms that the anomalocarids liked to eat, and if their food source went extinct, then they would be hit pretty hard. This is not unlikely in early Ediacaran Cambrian times because extinction rates were really high at the time since there was a lot of what we call evolutionary experimentation going on where all these different animal body forms and types were kind of being tried out because there was kind of this free open world of all these niches that animals, you know, evolved to try and fill and then something better would come along and make that other thing go extinct. And this was happening all over the place. And this was kind of the role anomalocarids played or one of the roles. I mean, they were really successful, but, you know, better, stronger, faster predators eventually came on the scene that kind of took their place. So who was this that took over the predation position of anomalocarids? Who became the apex predators after they went extinct? Well, like I talked about arthropods, like certain species of trilobites, were already preying on other organisms at the time. Although they were much smaller organisms, they were still effective predators and they were getting bigger throughout, or some species were getting bigger throughout the late Cambrian Ordovician time. They were also Eurypterids that took over immediately after Anomalocarids went extinct. These sea scorpions, some of them were pretty small, but some of them got really huge, like taller than your average human huge. So it would have been pretty terrifying to be around with the sea scorpions. But there were also annelids, the group of animals that includes modern worms, that were also predators, which is pretty crazy. They evolved specialized feeding structures around this time that allowed them to catch and eat prey. So imagine predator worms. I couldn't find any really cool pictures of big predator worms from the Cambrian. I don't think they were that big, but that would have been pretty crazy. But one of the biggest things that took over after anomalocarids and kind of during and after eurypterids as apex predators were jawed fish. Jawed fish like placoderms and early sharks evolved later in the Paleozoic and basically took over as predators of the seas from then on. So even though anomalocarids, the very first apex predators of Earth, are now extinct, their impact, not even the time they were living, but their impact long after they went extinct, cannot be overstated. They really set Earth on a trajectory of evolutionary advancement and diversification. But they didn't seem to slow down trilobites much. Actually, there was not a lot that could slow down trilobite radiation and diversification throughout the Paleozoic era, the near 300 million years that they lived. Trilobites actually survived 20 plus mass extinction events. And it wasn't until the largest mass extinction in Earth's history that they finally went extinct. So if you want to hear about how these trilobites managed to survive so many dang extinction events and why and how they finally went extinct, what finally took them out, then check out this next video, which I will link up here for you. And as always, references are linked in my description box below, and I can't wait to see you guys next time. Bye!